So, most of the seminars this weekend have not been directly on parkour, but we're here because of parkour. And uh, part of that is because um, I feel like a lot of these things that we've been talking about, how to deal with injuries, how to develop mobility, how to strengthen, how to do strength and conditioning, are, are really necessary parts of the parkour community. A lot of guys in the parkour community know how to do a vault. They don't know how to program or how to do a proper deadlift. They don't know how to stay safe. They don't know how to develop biomechanics. And all those things connect to how you perform parkour. And all those things are, are integral to surviving in the long run in parkour. Um, but I want you guys to leave with an understanding that all of those things um, are connected to parkour. They're not, they're not just completely different. When, when, uh, when Charlie was talking about how we approach bodyweight training, a lot of those same concepts apply to how we can approach parkour training. And, uh, when Rennie's talking about strength training, a lot of those same concepts apply to how we approach parkour training. And what I want people to do is I want you guys to go and study the, uh, the fitness world, the track and field, gymnastics, all these people who have looked at how to get bodies to perform at the highest levels and take those methods and see how you can apply them to parkour. That's where we start programming parkour in a progressive way. I believe that parkour has the capacity to be one of the most powerful tools for developing the human body. Um, because parkour reflects what our bodies are supposed to do. Um, I come from a, an evolutionary biology and anthropology background as a student, and it's something that I've always kind of kept up on. And one of the models that I like to think of is of play as the, the means by which animals develop the skills that help them survive in their evolved niche, right? So if you watch a puppy play, a puppy is going to chase things, it's going to grab onto things and pull them with its teeth, it wants to play tug of war, it wants to wrestle, right? What is it that wolves, which are the ancestors of dogs, how do they make their living in the world? They chase animals down, they grab them with their teeth, they pull them to the ground, they hold them there, and they eat them. <laughs> right? If you watch a kitten play, what does a kitten do? A kitten stalks things. Right? It pounces on things, it grabs them with its feet, it kicks them all with its back all hind legs, and it bites on them a lot, right? That's because that's how a cat kills its prey. Well, what happens when you... What happens when you watch children play? What about if you remember back to your own childhood, do you remember doing parkour-like stuff? Right? How many of you have thought to yourself, I wish I had never stopped doing parkour when I was a kid? Raise your hand. Okay. <laughs> Frosty's like, I didn't ever stop. That's why he's so awesome, right? There we go. But, uh, but this is our evolved play behavior. It's not the only play behavior, right? Kids like to build forts and they like to, they like to fight. They like to uh, do combat and I think that's important too. But I think that this is a huge piece of it. A hu probably the biggest piece of it is learning to control your own body through space. That's what parkour is about. Um, so if we, if we develop the science of that, if we really dedicatedly find out how we can expand the human ability to move through space, to move over obstacles, we're going to create athletes who will be amazing, right? And that's what I want to see. And I want people to take a serious approach, a methodical approach, but at the same time, don't forget to be playful. Does that make sense? Okay. So I want you guys to just get a little bit of that understanding of uh, from the physical fitness world. So, how do we adapt to exercise? How do you get better at parkour? Right? If you come in one day and you can do an eight foot broad jump, what makes you better? Right? It's the same thing that makes you better at doing the planche. Progressive overload. Right? You wanna, uh, where's Corey? There we go, Corey. I, you will not be able to understand my handwriting, so I'm just gonna use her as my assistant. <laughs> Okay, progressive overload, put it up there, right? When you're a novice in parkour, and you went out and you did a bunch of jumps, what did you feel like afterwards? Awesome. <laughs> did anybody feel thrashed, right? You remember how their, 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 their claws just destroyed afterwards? The day after your first jam. The day after your first jam, how'd you feel? 
Did you not want to sit down on the toilet? <laughs> We're like, can't they have toilets that are flat? <laughs> yeah, bars attached. Okay. So we, parkour has, has the capacity to demand a lot of us. There's a model of physical fitness, which is basically strength, agility, coordination, accuracy, balance, precision, um, endurance, stamina, flexibility, and I always forget the tenth one. Can anyone tell me the tenth one? Did I say power and speed? Anyways, that's, that's most of them. Um, are, do you guys think those are all required to do parkour? Right? So if we can, if we know that parkour demands those physical capacities, then we can find ways to progressively demand more of our body in those capacities through training parkour. Does that make sense? Now, I don't think that parkour is the optimal means to demand the development of certain qualities. Right? You could, you could focus on getting stronger by jumping up on a wall and, that's really high and you have to put your foot super high and then standing up on it. That's a parkour movement and it's going to get deep hip strength. It's going to get some of the effects that you get from a squat, but it's not as easily progressively loadable or as easy to understand as just doing squats in the gym. But there's a lot of things that, that, that doing any sort of outside training is not necessary because we can do that in parkour just as well. Does that make sense? So if we want to be faster at doing parkour, we can build courses like we built at the competition this weekend, and we can run them as fast as we can. And that's going to be the fastest uh, way for us to get better at getting fast in parkour. Uh, we had an interesting experiment recently. Yeah? Have you ever um, laid out, so you take those, I don't know if you had seven things, right? Speed, mm -hmm. strength, agility? Uh, it's ten, ten, ten models, yeah. Jim Colley's uh, defined the okay, 10 elements. Process. Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. You know, have you ever laid them out and said, okay, these six I think are best trained through parkour, these two through weightlifting, and these two through... Yeah, parkour. absolutely. I would say for a tracer, and I think actually in a lot of ways for most athletes, I think power, speed, agility, coordination, uh, precision, um, stamina, endurance, so that's seven of the categories right there are best trained through parkour for us. Power. 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 What, power is rate of force development, right? Okay. okay. What is the traditional means by which power is, is generally trained in, uh, in, in the sports community, in the fitness community? There's two primary methods. There's plyometrics and Olympic lifting or or um, speed lifting, right? You can do jump squats, you can do, you can do lifts that are loaded to a certain degree. Okay, so which one of those maps to parkour really easily? Plyometrics. Parkour can be seen as a plyometric method of developing physical capacity. We do a lot of jumps and landings and it develops reactive strength. So we see a lot of traceurs, guys who are naturally talented, have really high reactive ability. Right? So they may not be that strong when we put them on a squat, but their ability to translate that squat into force in jumping is really tremendous. But what we want to do is we want to get them to go ahead and strength train and then refine our understanding of what's already happening in parkour. Right? If we know that parkour does help guys learn to have really high reactive ability, how can we understand better how to uh, stimulate that reactive ability? Right? I think plyometric methods, I don't think uh, tracers should do plyometrics, right? Because you're already taking so many impacts, you're already loading those structures so much in your, in your training that going out and adding to that is a bad idea. I see lots of guys who are in parkour, uh, on parkour forums are like, uh, I'm going to do air alert. Air alert's a plyometric program, right? And it doesn't work, right? Because you're already doing that. But you take a guy who does parkour and you have him take his squat from 150 pounds to 300 pounds and his vertical jump will go up 6 to 8 inches. His broad jump will go up a foot. Um, Justin Sweeney, to, uh, take your shirt off. Um, no, he doesn't need to take his shirt off. Um, so Justin, when we, when we first tested you, your vertical jump was about 22 inches, right? Yeah, so 22 inches. He was 130, 140 pounds. 
and he, uh, he could squat about 150 pounds. Um, after four months uh, or six months of weight training, uh, he had a 27 inch vertical leap with a, uh, at a body weight of 160 pounds. And uh, what was it, 275 you were squatting for reps at that point? Okay. His broad jump went from 8.2 to 9.5 or something like that. That's the type of thing that we can get by adding strength training to it. But we get a lot out of just parkour, right? We, get, we can take a guy f with no other training and get eight inches on his broad jump just from doing parkour. And we haven't refined that understanding very well. Does that make sense? When you think about, I'm going to go out and do a bunch of jumps today, do you think progressive overload of the functions that allow you to jump well? Who, who, who thinks about that when they plan their parkour uh, stru structures? Okay. So in a room of a bunch of tracers, four of us raised our hand, and a few of uh, and a couple of you guys looked pretty half-hearted when you did so. Um, do you, you, if you understand plyometric methods, if you understand shock training, if you understand all these things, you can attack parkour training more effectively. Does that make sense? You can get the benefits of parkour better if you understand how to do it. So, if you go out and you have a jump, and let's say you can do an eight foot precision, right? Um, what is a stimulus that achieves progressive overload, that doesn't overload the body, that you can then recover from and be more able to do it, right? If you go out and you say do the traditional parkour method, let's do a hundred eight foot jumps. Does that stimulus build power? Does that stimulus build speed strength, the characteristic that most defines effective capacity in parkour? No, it builds endurance. It builds stamina. You'll come back and oftentimes you'll actually regress if you try to do uh, training like that. If, if, you're, if your goal is to get a bigger, stronger jump, right? And that shouldn't always be your goal, but it is a pro uh, very big thing in parkour to understand. So um, in, in plyometric training, they say for a given exercise, you usually want to do 15 to 20 reps. That's all, right? So if you want to go out and you want to attack um, power training for parkour, what you're looking at is going out and doing 15 to 20 reps. And that's, it can be less than that. It can be 10 reps, too. The, the key thing that you should be looking for is diminishment in performance. Does that make sense? So if you go out and you, uh, you, you're going to do um, a wall run, right? And we're going to see how high you can get. It's easier if we don't have a wall run that um, we can just see just how high we can get, right? Tap your hand. You, what you'll find is usually you're, you're not going to be able to do that many before you start. You know, uh, your first one will be, say, 11 feet. And then, you know, you go 11-2, you're warming up. 11-4, okay, cool, I'm, I'm still starting to feel pretty good. 11-6, 11-8, you've topped out. Okay, you're like, but man, I really want to hit that 12 foot, that 12 footer today. That's what I'm excited about. So I'm going to do it again, and, I, and again, and again. And pretty soon it's 11 6, and it's 11 uh, 4, and it's 11 3, and you're getting frustrated. That's, that's not effective, right? At that point, you're, you're starting to stimulate that um, endurance model. So we have two models here that I think are important to understand. F uh, in, um, in Charlie's talk, you talked about uh, Zatsiorsky's book, Science and Practice of Strength Training, right? Um, he talks about parametric relationships, right? That means that these two variables have to oppose each other, right? You cannot have optimal, like the highest level of force and the highest level of velocity. Does that make sense? So when a baseball pitcher throws a 95 mile an hour fastball, that's high velocity. That's on this end of the curve. When a when Andy Bolton deadlifts a thousand pounds, that's on this end of the curve. The two never meet, right? Nobody will ever pull a deadlift of a thousand pounds at 96 miles per hour, right? Nobody will ever pick up a thousand pound baseball and throw it 96 miles per hour. So, so 
it, what we need to understand about this is we operate here on the curve in what's called the speed strength range, right? We are, we're not actually out here in the pure speed range most of the time. Uh, the pure speed range relies tremendously on um, fascia and lig uh, ligaments and, and tendons. It relies on the reactive capacity of the body. It relies on these whipping mechanics. Force relies on muscle. Your tendons can't do a lot to help you. You don't get a tremendous amount of uh, stretch response when you're doing a really heavy deadlift. The, the point is just that we're relying on different structures, right? And we need to make both of these structures strong. And one of the interesting models, and this is why you see a lot of jack sprinters these days, is that what we tend to find is that um, high force maneuvers transfer better to high velocity maneuvers than vice versa. What we're looking for is movements that have a big bang for their buck. Does that make sense? So, if you, if you take a, a ping pong player, ping pong is all about pure speed, right? Um, table tennis, sorry, table tennis players, pure speed. Those guys move really, really fast. They're small and they're not that strong. If you, if you ask them to do heavy deadlifts, you're not going to see a big, uh, a big response from them. Um, but when we're in this range here, what we see is that you do a deadlift, you do a bunch of deadlifts, we find that you respond better here. Does that make sense? What we want to do is we want to move this whole curve over this way, right? We want to be able to express more velocity and more force. So what we find is that we get a more potent stimulus that tends to respond better by moving the force side of the curve as opposed to the velocity side of the curve. So um, that's just an important thing to understand. The next thing we're going to talk about that I wanted to touch on this is intensity and duration. 10,000 pound deadlift, marathon. You can't lift a 1,000 pound deadlift a thousand times, right? And again, the interesting thing is that we see that this side of the curve moves the whole curve over better than this side. Does that make sense? So, um, and, and the reason is, uh, if we think of intensity as percentage of one rep max, are you guys familiar with this model, right? So, if you're lifting, if you can squat 1,000 pounds, then 800 pounds is 80% of your one rep max. If you can squat, you know, 100 pounds, 80 pounds is 80%. Uh, so, when we change the percent of your one rep max that a given movement represents, we change... Uh, we change the relative effort for everything out on the curve there, right? So if we can lift, if we can move this up, and all of a sudden we can lift, uh, you know, if we went from 200 pounds to 300 pounds on our squat, or 400 pounds on our squat, then when we try to lift, when we try to lift our own body, when we try to jump, we're lifting a lower load relative to our our maximum potential, and therefore it's less fatiguing. It's less fatiguing to lift 50% of your max than 80% of your max. Is that clear? Now, at a certain point, this, the parametric relationship here becomes more of a problem. It becomes harder to affect this area of the curve with this area, or vice versa. And in fact, you start seeing the curve want to shift one way or the other. So. If you are an elite level marathon runner, you will have difficulty maintaining the strength end of your curve, the intensity end of your curve. If you are an elite level power lifter, you will have difficulty ma uh, maintaining endurance, right? A lot of elite level power lifters have trouble walking upstairs because they get fatigued, right? It's not a very big percentage of their one rep max, but their body is so tuned to developing uh, potential intensity that it it's lost its capacity to, to really uh, deal with duration, if that makes sense. So, um, <clears throat> the, the important point for us is that that actually doesn't apply to most of us very much at all, okay? Particularly when we're talking about trying to change the intensity end of the spectrum. You don't see adaptions from intensity that really negatively affect endurance until you're talking about two and a half times body weight on a deadlift 
or two times body weight on a squat. We're talking about a guy who can do a Maltese cross on the rings. Does that make sense? So, so none of us really need to worry about losing endurance from gaining strength. And in fact, most of us will continue to gain endurance from gaining strength. We'll be just pushing this curve over. Okay? So for novices, intermediate athletes, uh, people focused in the speed strength end of the curve, focusing on high intensity act uh, activities and high force activities as a, as a way to, to move that curve over is really effective for us. Um, there's two more things that I wanted to touch on. Um, well, this is, this is what we call power biasing your training. If you, we want to, in parkour, parkour can be anything from, from going over a rail to going over a mountain, right? For, uh, from my perspective, parkour is if overcoming obstacles effectively. And that, an obstacle can be anything. So the, the duration of uh, Mount Everest is high, right? The relative intensity of a given movement going up Mount Everest is not nearly as high as running a 100-meter sprint or jumping over a high rail. So the question we are always having to ask is, how do we best move the whole curve over? Because we could be anywhere in that curve. Does that make sense? I keep saying that. I'm going to try to, try to use a different phrase here. Um, power bias your training. The second model that I want you guys to think about in approaching parkour training is skill bias. So we talked about this earlier. If you take an elite level gymnast and you take him into a, and you ask him to power lift, he's going to perform much closer to the standard of a power lifter than the power lifter is going to perform to the standard of the gymnast. Okay? A, being able to do a plange means that you have sufficient strength in your shoulders to express a high level of force pushing a bench, pushing a simple object away from you. Being able to push a simple object away from you does not indicate that you have mastered the the, uh, the control of your entire nervous system, all of your movements, uh, all of your, your motor units, all of the, um, the core to be able to do a planche. If you take someone who has a 500 pound bench press, they will be very slightly ahead of the average person possibly in learning how to do a planche, but not much. But if you take somebody who can do a planche, they're going to be much, much closer to expressing an elite level of strength uh, with a simpler object. So that's what I think in parkour of it as complexity bias. We want to do things that are more complex. And that's why when I talk about parkour athletes eventually being some of the best athletes you see on the planet, it's why. Because we are always looking for more complex challenges. Right? We're trying to find a new route that is really difficult. And it's teaching our nervous system to deal with problems. It's teaching us to coordinate ourselves in a broad variety of ways that's going to allow us to uh, face simple challenges relatively easier. We had a really interesting uh, demonstration of, of this uh, recently. One of our students uh, was a college sprinter. He ran a 11 second hundred, which is fast. It's not super fast, but it's fast. So we were doing sprints across the gym, and we were testing the, the different athletes in the class. And he was blowing everybody away when we just did a sp uh, simple sprint. We added one box, and he went from far ahead of everybody to in the middle of the pack in that class. We added two boxes to the situation, and he was now the last person in class to finish it. So, was this a new student? Um, he was relatively new to that level of class. So, he had a capacity to 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 do something simple extremely well, but when we added the complexity level, he fell off tremendously. Um, if Usain Bolt had been running our obstacle course competition on Friday he probably wouldn't have finished the first course, right? Um, so we want, to, uh, we, want to do, we want to bias our training towards complexity. So if we, if we think about parkour, there's, we can essentially break it down into training that develops skill, right? Training that develops physical attributes, and training that develops mental attributes. Corey, do you want to write those up? Thank you. So, it's, it's, a, it's, a complex, it's a complex thing to break down, right? If we want to develop skill, maybe we go out and do that, that precision jump a hundred times. Because skill is developed primarily through practice, right? So if the precision jump has a lot of technical difficulty to it, 
then doing 100 can be a very useful thing. If it's simply a standing broad jump, doing 100 isn't going to give us a lot of benefit. But doing 10 to 20, focusing on power, focusing on quality of repetition, and trying to progressively overload the system so that we do bigger ones, that's going to give us the types of benefits that we want to see. That's going to give us progressive overload for that attribute. Um, and then the other characteristic that is really important that I didn't touch on that much the last year that we did this is mental, right? So let's say we've taken a guy and he can do um, a rail precision that's two feet, uh, that's three feet off the ground, that's slanted, it's weird, it's uh, it requires a lot of skill. He's jumping from a weird position. You know, it took him a long time to get there. He did a hundred of them. It was great. Okay, take the same guy and we. Uh, and we have him do broad jumps in the gym. And we have him do 20 toe tail, 20 foot contacts every time. Uh, we, you know, we do it twice a week. We see steady improvements. Now the guy can do a 10 foot broad jump. So this, this guy seems like a real, real wonderful athlete. Now we put that, that jump 10 feet off the ground. And it's a completely different story. Right? We put that jump in a tree. It's a completely different story. The first time Tyson and I, um, Mark did a jump today that Tyson and I did uh, a few years ago. It was the first time we'd ever done a jump between two uh, tree branches, and it scared the crap out of us. And it was easy. It was really easy. It's not a huge jump. It's like seven feet wide with a two-foot drop, right? That's a jump that we can almost fall across. Why was it so scary in the tree? Because it's an unfamiliar environment. We have a broken visual field, which we're not used to. The structures are odd. And we're not mentally prepared for that. And so all the physical training day we did and all the skill training we did didn't necessarily transfer to that situation because we didn't have mental preparation for it. So in your training, you have to think about developing the, the specific skills that you want. You have to think about developing the physical qualities that you want. And you have to think about developing the mental qualities. Um, so, one of the things that is really interesting is, is, is fear. How do you deal with fear? Um, who's been afraid when they're doing parkour? Everybody, right? Everybody. You, uh, I mean, I don't, I don't think we'd do it if, we did, if it didn't make us afraid. Because that's where we have this potential to overcome something. That's what becomes so inspiring. When you get that rush after you've done a jump, that's, uh, I really think that, that in, in some ways that's the heart of parkour. Because my, one of the models I like for parkour is it's effectively, it's developing the ability to overcome obstacles effectively. But I think the inverse is equally true. It's developing yourself through overcoming obstacles. And we feel a tremendous amount of development of self through overcoming an obstacle. In mountaineering, they say, it's not what the man does to the mountain, it's what the mountain does to the man. And that's what we're trying to get out of parkour, too. So the mental side is, is one that I think is harder to translate, and it's a lot harder to teach. Right? We do a class in our uh, program called, it's the fear class, right? We try to make you guys, we try to find something that is fearful for the students and help them overcome it. And that is much more difficult than teaching them how to do a Kong. Right? If I teach them how to do a Kong, I say, you're going to do this drill, you're going to do this drill. When your body is in this position, I know that you have the physical uh, ability to move on to the next level. When we look at a jump, I can tell to some degree based on their posture if that person's afraid or if that person is moving through the fear to the point that they can make the jump. And I can cue them, but I never know 100% what's in their head. And I don't know necessarily how they deal with fear in such a way as to overcome it. My own process of dealing with fear isn't necessarily verbal. It's intuitive. It's inside me. And so trying to externalize it and give it to somebody else is a real problem. And, and what's scary is dangerous. We get hurt a lot of the time because we're afraid. right? How many times have you looked at a jump, gone for it, and hesitated after you took off and found yourself halfway there? Uh, flips are a great one. 
You know, you go up to do a back tuck and you decide halfway up that you weren't really going to do a back tuck, but it's a little too late and you come down on your head. Okay. Um, I'm, I'm actually interested. I, I think we should open a little conversation here at the end of the presentation on what are the tools that you do, uh, use to overcome fear and what are the tools that, that you think you can translate to someone else? How would you teach someone to deal with fear? Um, one of the things that, uh, that I know that the Yamakaze did was that they, they would climb on something high and they would just hang out there. Right? They would play guitar, they would eat sandwiches, they'd chill because it take, took the mind time to adapt to being in that circumstance of being at height. And we, we always discourage beginners from playing at height because that's where the potential for death comes in parkour. Parkour is really quite safe outside of dealing with heights. Um, but there's also now that potential for growth. If parkour is about overcoming fear, there's a potential for growth in the situations that are most fear-inducing, which are potentially dangerous, right? You, at some point in your training, I think you have to step up and you have to, um, to put yourself in a situation of overcoming those fears, of dealing with the jumps that are really scary, that really have consequences. Um, there's a couple other things that I think are really important mentally in parkour, aside from dealing with fear. Um, we have to be creative, right? Uh, how many times have you heard someone say, oh, I love, man, I wish I had an area like this. There's nowhere to train where I live, right? There's nowhere to train where I live. Um, <laughs> there's somewhere to train everywhere, right? Uh, if you, I, uh, we heard someone mention Ido Portal earlier today. I, I suggest you guys all go check out an Ido Tor a Portal video on YouTube because he's a guy who basically does stuff that's very similar to what we do. It's about exploring the human capacity to move. That's what he'll tell you it is. And he does it mostly on the ground. He does it on flat ground. So he does tons of variations of quadrupedal movement and spinning around on his hands and hand balancing. And all of it, to me, looks very transferable to parkour. I think that guy, if he came in here into the gym, he'd be able to keep up with us in a lot of ways. He'd, he'd, he'd demonstrate a beautiful skill. Super dope. <laughs> yeah, he's super dope. Uh, <laughs> because he's creating complexity. We talked about that model. If you have complex skills, they transfer well. He's creating an immense amounts of complexity in his training on, the, on flat ground. Flat ground is the first obstacle that we have to overcome. We, can, we, can, uh, we like to play with what we call low-line training here. So we find an area that, that doesn't have a lot of big jumps, doesn't have a lot of potential stuff, and we find a million different ways to move through the space. Um, and it's not efficient. It's not the most effective way to overcome any of those obstacles. But it's developing the qualities that allow us to overcome obstacles effectively. And that's the important part about it to me. And if you can go and you can look at any environment and find a way to do that and find all of the potential challenges in it, you're going to be way ahead when it comes to skill stuff. You're going to be way ahead when it comes to mental stuff. You're going to be way ahead when it comes to physical stuff, right? So developing that type of uh, creativity is huge. Um, that's why we had Jeremy do the, uh, the vision uh, clinic today. So I hopefully Frosty will come back and do a uh, creativity clinic next year, right? Um, and and the, the final thing that I want to throw at you guys as a mental challenge is the balance between being playful and methodical. Right? Do you do parkour because it's fun? Yeah, uh, yeah right? So if, if I come at you and I say, okay, well, I'm going to make you the best parkour athlete on the planet, and it's going to be like this. You're going to do 20-foot 20, 20 contacts of wall passes, you know, three days a week. You're going to do... 20 tic tacs three days a week. You're going to do this type of, uh, of uh, you're going to do Kongs like this. You're going to do this, 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 this. And it's going to be strict and uh, structured all the time. Do you think that'd be fun? <laughs> no, it's not. I've, I've done that to myself to a degree. I like methodical things. I like studying fitness and trying to find a way to challenge myself. And so I've written myself really complex and intricate directed ways of training. And I burn out on it. It's boring. Um, so we have to be playful because that's the heart of it. We just we talked about it in the beginning. Parkour is expression of human evolved play capacity. Um, so if you're not playing, then you're missing the point. 
But we, it, for me, progression is fun. Getting better is fun. That's why I do squats. That's why I do deadlifts. Because, man, when I can do a bigger jump, that's exciting for me. So there is this element of being able to take a methodical approach to parkour that, um, that can really help you, that can help you do mo more fun things in the future. And I think that my balance isn't necessarily Levi's balance or Frosty's balance um, or anybody else's balance. But I want to challenge you guys to just think about how you can balance those two elements in your training, how you can bring a playful element to it while maintaining some element of method of trying to understand what you're trying to achieve and not focusing so much on, uh, on what you're trying to achieve that you lose sight of the fact that you're doing it for fun in the first place. But what I want to touch base on is um, incremental progression. I want to talk to you about that. One of the things that we, I think, do very particularly well here um, and that we focused on is the idea that you can build drills that take things apart and let you build it progressively. So when you started, how many of you guys started to learn a Kong by trying it? How many of you guys bailed? Clip your feet within the first three tries. How many of you guys continued to clip your knees for like months after you initially learned to Kong? Okay. Some of you guys are not as klutzy as I am. Um, but a few of you are, so thank God for you. Um, we, that, that, that's not the best way to do it, right? We can teach people how to do a vault on the ground and build up. We can teach people pieces of the mechanics and build up. So, um, is there anyone here who, who has difficulty with Kongs who hasn't or can't do them? No, we're all, we're all advanced at this point. That's, that's what I figured. <laughs> um, so we'll go ahead and just demonstrate that. Tyson, will you jump up and demonstrate for me? So Ty, uh, Tyson's just going to take you really quickly through our Kong progression. So the first drill is about being able to dive onto your hands and control body position with your hips over your shoulders. There we go. He can dive onto his hands, he can control his hips over his shoulders. Okay. Now he's going to turn back. And what he's going to think about is being able to get his feet to pass where his hands were. And the cue that we give is push up off your hands, pull back with your hands. Okay? That allows your body to get height. There we go. Okay? Uh, throw us that mat, will you, Tyler? Taylor? Tyson, you overjumped my, my challenge. Okay. Then we can go hands on the red, feet on the blue in front. And obviously now we can go hands to the blue, feet all the way over, etc. And now, now he's learned the basic mechanics of doing a Kong. Go ahead and Kong over it. Um, he's learned it in a situation where he's not afraid and he's completely safe. And it's actually harder to do this on the ground than it is over a vault box. So once he gets to this point, we start him on the box. And we say, vault your feet up on top of it on top of it. You don't need to go over right away. And then feet have to touch the back side. Okay, then land on the other side, but put one foot on the box as you go over. And then all the way over. Okay? So, I just taught Tyson Cheka how to do a Kong. How cool is that? <laughs> 